I'd like to spend a moment introducing our illustrious panel today. On your far right, we have Tara Hodges, and she completed her BS in computer science cum laude at SPU in 2009. So, a kind of a recent graduate. <laughs> She's married to Sean, an SPU alum, who is out in the hallway with their 16-month-old oh, son, Zach. <laughs> yeah, he might He's be a gone really now. little cutie pie. <laughs> and, um, and of course, they're very proud parents of Zach. She has two advanced certific certifications from the UW and works full-time at Boeing in the IT department as an information, uh, as an application security specialist. <laughs> and she's currently living the work-life balancing act with full-time employment and raising a toddler, and she'll share her insights about that. <clears throat> um, next, we have Shauna Causey, and she began her marketing career with the Seattle Mariners before leading teams at, now take note, Fox Sportsnet, Warner Brothers, Comcast, Nordstrom, Google, Decide.com, and eBay. She's currently Vice President of Marketing for EveryMove.org, and she hosted the first ever Startup Weekend Women's Edition to, encourage, to encourage more women coders of all levels and age ranges to develop and launch their businesses. She was voted one of the top 100 women in tech by Tech Flash and has appeared on ABC News, CBS News, NBC News, Bloomberg West, and Marie Claire Magazine as an e-commerce and startup analyst. And our own beloved, Dr. Sellers, Dr. Tina Shermer Sellers, here on the SBU campus, has a keen interest in the subject of women in the workplace, having co-authored the paper, Women Called, a qualitative study of Christian women duly called to motherhood and career. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist and director of the Medical Family Therapy Program and instructor of marriage and family therapy here at SBU. She's an international author, frequent speaker and blogger. She lives here in Seattle with her beloved Gary, where they have four grown kids, four grand puppies, and a Westphalia <laughs> named Lola. I also have to add, because I don't get to do this very often, that she's um, her work as a marriage and family therapist, um, I'm sorry, she's also a clinical sexologist, all right? And her work is built on helping relationships thrive in a context where people see themselves and each other as God's beloved and allow themselves to heal from religious sexual shame. Her latest claim to fame is an internationally popular website which we should all write down, <laughs> thankgodforsex.org. Oh. And I think I'll send that along to my husband. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, so thank you all for being here. It's great that you've taken the time to spend with us tonight. We're looking forward to having your insights. So um, we'll have a couple of questions that we'll have the panel, panel answer, and then we'll open it up for a Q&A from the audience um, towards the end. But um, we'll start off with the first question, and we'll start with you. Okay. Tell us about yourself, where you currently work, your title, and your career path that led you to your present position. All right. Okay, so you heard a little bit that I'm here at SPU. And I actually didn't, you know, come out of the womb and say, oh, I want to grow up and be a marriage and family therapist. I actually started out as a junior high and high school teacher. And it was there hanging out with kids that I started to realize that their home life was significantly affecting their ability to learn. And hanging out with them, I started to hear the stories of their lives and thought, gosh, I wonder if there is a way that we could impact what was happening at home sooner. And that's what brought me back to grad school. So I had this crazy idea. Now, of course, this was, I'm old, so that was, this was back in like the late 80s. And so I was thinking to myself, well, I'll go to school, I'll get my degree in family therapy, and then I'll go back and teach. I was at a private school, um, sort of similar to Lakeside here in Seattle. And I was thinking, I'll start like a counseling center there on campus and make it really easy for parents to say, oh, I'm going to my kid's school, even though they'd be getting counseling, right? I thought, well, that'd be sly. So um, that's what I thought I would do. Well, when I went to grad school, I had a two-year-old. When I finished grad school, he was almost five. And I was thinking, gosh, you know, it would probably be good to have another one at some point since uh, he was already almost five. 
So got pregnant right away, had a little bit of schoolwork left to do, finished that, and actually, um, I think I had my daughter Chloe and then came back two weeks later and took my last final. So then I was thinking, do I really want to go back into a situation, even though I loved teaching at that level, where I have to be on campus five days a week from eight in the morning to three or four in the afternoon. That was like a schedule I thought, wow, there's not a lot of flexibility there. So I kind of developed this dream while I was in grad school. What if I could teach at the grad school level, teach family therapy? Because I had just fallen in love with the field when I was in school. And you have a little bit more flexibility in your work life when you teach on a college campus. So I literally had Chloe in February and had my first adjunct class here at SPU that summer and began teaching adjunct for about seven years and then went full-time in 1997 and finished my doctorate degree along the way. So, and I'll, I'll talk more about how and why that all happened that way, but, um, but it had a lot to do with what I learned about work-life balance as to why I ended up going that direction. Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> I, I played volleyball here at SPU and I graduated in 99. So I guess we have a few generations on, on this group here. But, um, I, and really, a, a lot of my career I can trace back to sports. So I, um, all the way back to when I was 15, I was on the um, baseball field, softball field um, in high school. And my coach pulled me aside after, after uh, practice and said, hey, the Seattle Mariners are interviewing and having tryouts for ball girls. Do you want to do you want to try out to be a ball girl? And I and he only pulled me aside. So I'm like, this is amazing. You know, I'm thinking my whole life's gonna change. And um, I'll just tell you real quick. So I went to I went to tryouts. It was back in the kingdom, and there was like 200 girls in there. And I'm thinking, oh, it's not like a few of us. Like, there's no way I'm gonna get this. And somehow um, I ended up being one of the five or six they selected. And I ended up staying with the Mariners for seven years. And so one of the reasons I actually came to SPU was was actually sports. I wanted to play volleyball and I wanted to continue working for the Mariners and I didn't want to leave the state. And I uh, ended up having such a great experience here, but I really saw it as sort of just one stepping stone to the things I wanted to do in my career. And so when you start working when you're 15, you get a chance to kind of really get into business and see all the different aspects. So for the Mariners, I got a chance to work in every single department, um, operations. I even worked in the security department. Um, and really got a chance to see how an organization works. So by the time I got to SPU, I knew that I probably wanted to work in marketing, but when I took marketing classes here, I thought they were sort of easy because I'd already done some of this stuff at, at work. Um, and so I decided to, to major in finance because I thought, well, I better figure out how to invest my money because I'm probably not going to make very much money in marketing. <laughs> Um, so I did. I, I graduated with a finance degree, uh, business business finance, and then went straight back into communications and marketing. And really, after I graduated, I didn't have a job. I um, it was really it was one of those times where um, sort of felt like a little bit of a recession, where it was just really hard to get a position. And and I think probably um, in a different way, like computer science. I mean, you know, it's, you, you get paid a lot of money and you have a job, especially right now, right out of college. It, people are fighting for you, but. Back then, for really what my skills were, um, I had done everything I could do with the Mariners, and so it was really time to move on. And I, so there was probably about a nine months there where I was really actively looking for a position, and it was really tough. Graduating college and not having a job, and being so goal oriented and knowing exactly what I wanted to do. Um, but through the Seattle Mariners contacts, I started working in, in TV. So I went to Fox Sports Net and started working on the contracts with the Mariners that we had done. So it was marketing and operations, and um, and then really just had to work my way up. So it was a lot of me going over to our execs offices saying, hey, I have some spare time, how can I help you? <laughs> and then taking on projects that I would normally never have had a chance to take on just because I was persistent and I really wanted to move up and I was very goal-oriented. So I would say looking back, I probably didn't have the most balance. I was very focused on... I have all these things I want to do in my career, and I, and, you know, I still do have a lot of things I want to do in my career. Um, and it was a major focus for me, and nothing and nobody was going to stop me from, from doing those things. I was uh, pretty determined. So um, 
So I think there's good things and bad things about that. I definitely wouldn't say that's that the right path to take. I, I should have had a little bit more balance, I think. But, uh, but yeah, worked in TV and then got a chance to um, to work at, a, at one of the most hated companies in the world, Comcast. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where I had, I did have an incredible opportunity today. My, they had to talk me into going into the interview. Went into the interview and they said, you're going to manage two million subscribers and you're going to have a budget of two million dollars. And I was 23 years old. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking, wow, this sounds like an incredible opportunity. I have a lot to learn. I really like the person who's making the job offer to me. So all of a sudden, I thought, I can really grow here and learn a lot, uh, even though it was not a company that I had ever aspired to work for, especially coming from sports and TV. And um, So I had a chance to do a lot of community work at, at Comcast and um, had a chance to run our community relations efforts. We give a lot of money to the community. and So it got different experience there. And then... Um, went to Google for a year, then got recruited to Nordstrom, which was an incredible opportunity to start a new division there that was focused on digital and social media. And um, at that same time, I had a chance to start going out and speaking um, about digital and social media in the community. Just, it's like one of those things where you're at the right place at the right time. Social media was emerging and not a lot of people knew about it and I had experience with it. So I started being asked to speak and then I thought, I was deathly afraid of speaking, by the way. I mean, I can't even believe I'm here speaking to you. When I was at SPU, I would have blacked out right now. I was so <laughs> afraid of speaking. I mean, I can't, I, there's no way I can even communicate to you how terrible my fear was. So um, really overcame that fear and got out there and really started pushing myself to speak a lot more. And, um, and then, you know, working in, at a few Fortune 500 companies, I realized, wow, these companies are moving so slow. It just takes us forever to roll something out. We're talking about something, and two years later, we're going to roll it out, or six months later is about the fastest we could move. And I really like moving faster, and I saw what was happening in the startup world. So I started donating my time and was speaking and just with my volunteer time to helping startups and helping people who are starting companies. Even though I myself wasn't an expert in it, I started just helping them with marketing and helping any way I could. And... um, and it was pretty interesting speaking on, on, on this topic specifically because there's there's almost all men in this field still. Mm-hmm. And so bringing a different perspective to that, I think, um, and that's one of the reasons why I'm giving back to help try to get more women in the field because it's, it's still very one-sided. Um, but I had a chance to go into the startup world and worked at Decide.com and we had a chance to sell our company to eBay. Um, and then I took a year off and traveled and um, volunteered and then just started with this new startup called Every Move here in Seattle. And um, you guys should check it out when you get a chance. Yeah. I'm Tara and like I said, graduated in 2009. And while I was, I always knew that I wanted to do um, something with computers. <laughs> like I, when I was in high school and stuff, I was obsessed with building websites. So. And I would do that with my dad, and it was kind of how we would connect. So it was kind of just the natural path for me to do computer science. And um, I was here for four years, and uh, right after I graduated, I or you know, right before my, I graduated, I had an internship at Boeing. And um, they said, you sure you want to quit the degree? You, you should just quit your degree. You should come work with us some more. And I said, no, I'm going to finish that. And then I um, joined their college Um, recruitment program which is basically where they put you through uh, many different jobs every six months and they make you switch job roles within their IT department and so I've been oh I've been at Boeing ever since I left SPU which so I'm fairly early in my career and um, I love it there actually because I've been able to switch so many times I've had six different jobs there and um, whenever I get bored I just kind of move on to something else and I kind of told I told my manager that I said I gotta keep me busy because I'm gonna move if I <laughs> don't feel like I'm learning something new. So um, yeah, and another one of the reasons why I like staying with Boeing is because I feel like they really support the whole work-life balance thing for me. Um, when I'm at work, I'm at work. I don't like take personal calls or anything like that. But they also recognize that when I'm at home, I can turn off my work brain and be at home which is really good and um, yeah I love it Uh, I don't have much like my career is fairly new so I don't have as long of a history as that but um, right now I'm an application security architect so I um, basically help people find flaws in their software in internal software either stuff that we sell to other people or uh, in um, internal company use software so it's fun 
I love it. <laughs> I love to see a smile like that from somebody who loves their job. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the things that's interesting about each of them is how they have taken charge of their own careers. And um, Tina saw, saw she had a different idea. She learned something from her first role, and then she thought more deeply about it, moved into another arena. And then as she had, the, had her kids, she thought, how can I make this work? And she went after it. Um, same with Shauna. She was a go-getter from the from the get from the get-go, right? She she saw what she wanted. She was very girl-oriented, but also stalled a little bit for nine months, and that's a scary thing. And and if you go through your career life, you're going to stall at some point. <laughs> There's usually something that holds you up for a piece of time, but she kept at it and she kept pushing and going into new avenues. And then I love Tara because she's saying she's had six roles in, in about five years, and that's because she's been she's been active about that too. She's She's gone after it, and she's been. She said to her boss, "Keep me busy, keep me in front of new projects, because that's what's interesting to me." And so, it's always good to remember that you have to advocate for what you want. Nobody else is going to watch your career for you, and you have to be the one that's keeping tabs on it and pushing forward for what you want, what you want to achieve. Um, okay, so next question, panel. <laughs> um, I feel like I should have some game show music or something. <laughs> But um, so what challenges or opportunities have you experienced as a woman in the workforce? And how have you overcome or taken advantage of, of, of these opportunities? Um, and if, if you have a sp specific story to share about that, that would be helpful too. But what challenges or opportunities have you experienced as a woman in the workplace? Who wants to start? Shauna. I'll start. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to be really candid with this one and tell you a story. And uh, when I when I moved into, and, and I think some of it's gender related and some of it is just a learning experience for me. When I moved into the startup world, um, at the first startup I worked at, we had a meeting that was actually called War. That was the name of this meeting, right? And uh, it was a really important, so I'm, I'm an exec there, you know, there's only a few, a few of us execs and we're making all the decisions in the startup world. It's do or die. You have a limited amount of funding. You have to make the startup work to either go public or sell the company to somebody. Those are the success stories of the startup. You never want to not, you know, have it not work in the amount of time that you have and close down. That's that's complete failure. So, um, so this meeting was really important because we decided what we were going to do with the product and how we were going to serve and help customers with our product, which which in turn is is how successful you're going to be if you can if you can have something that people really love and use and scale it to a point where you can either go public or, or sell it. And it all really came down to this meeting. And, um, and you know, when you work for a startup, it's, you know, I think it's harder to have the balance because you, because of that urgency and that a limited amount of time you have to do something, but then after you sell a company, you can take a lot of time off, right? But, um, but during that time, it's, it's harder to have balance. Um, you really have to proactively try to have balance. So. So in some ways, work is more than work to me. It's, it's it, you know, and I hate it when people say it's not personal, don't take it personal, because actually it is personal, and that's exactly what I say back to them. I do take this to heart, this is personal for me. I'm, you know, I, I will get over things fast, but I do take things to heart. Um, so that's actually one of my, the worst things anybody could ever say to me, by the way. Um, but yeah, so we had this meeting called War, and we would make all of our product decisions in this meeting, and a lot of them, um, really all the major decisions for our startup. And like I said earlier, it's, it's, there's not very many women in this field, and especially at the executive level. I mean, I think the stat is something like nine or 10% percent, percent of execs in, you know, in not only, not only startups, Fortune 500 companies are women, right? So, um, so oftentimes I felt like I had to be louder with my voice because there wasn't, you know, it's a bunch, we were a shopping site. So it's a bunch of guys, you know, 30, uh, coders and you know five other execs, all men making the decisions on a shopping site. And if you think about most people who shop, you know, make all the shopping decisions in the household, it's women. So I felt like I really had a strong voice there and a reason to share my voice. But this meeting was tough. So not only was it called war, but um, and I think you know again part of this is gender and part of this is just my working style. But it was you know it, it was aggressive. It was in your face. We would you know voices were raised, you know, every once in a while there was like some sort of like, are you stupid type name calling, you know, and not in a way that it ever meant to be 
to hurt anyone. It wasn't meant to be hurtful, but it just got, it was a really tense meeting. And I realized that that's not my work style at all. In fact, I will be less productive in that type of work style than than one that's a little bit more collaborative or I felt a little bit more respectful. While the guys in that room did not feel like it was, they're even throwing a football around while we're talking. Um, and I'm, I'm all about sports. I'm just don't, not wanting to throw a football right now. I want to talk about work. So, um, so I really had a tough time in that meeting and to the point where after the meeting, I would have to go for a walk outside. I have to leave the building and I have to go for a walk and just like kind of like calm down. And, um, and I always felt like my voice wasn't actually heard in the meeting because I wasn't as loud as they were or as aggressive as they were or as in, in, my, in their face as they were. Um, but it was, it's just the style in a lot of startups, honestly. Um, so I finally ended up meeting with our CEO and I said, hey, look, this meeting just does not work for me and I want to have a voice in this meeting because it's, 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 it feels do or die. Like we have months to make this work and I want this to you know, be a success for all of us. I want all, everybody at this company to go out and have this life-changing event where they can go buy their first house. They can go do things they couldn't do before because you know, we all make money on this or, or we IPO. And, um, and uh, I thought that it was one of those tough conversations where you either like continue the, the relationship or maybe you don't, like maybe this is not the place for me. Um, but it was a great conversation, you know, I was really honest with what works for me and what doesn't and he really said like, I had no clue that you felt like that and I can see how somebody who doesn't have that kind of a work style would need a different environment and, and, and he did a really good job of, and together as a team we really did a really good job of just setting the meeting and setting an agenda and kind of working on the meeting differently. But I have to say like that was one point in my career where I was like, maybe I'm just going to leave this company because I don't know if this works for me and maybe startup life doesn't even work for me. I had some really big questions in my mind about if I could continue. And so I, again, I think part of that might be a, a, a women in tech thing. And part of it again is just my work style. Like I will not meet you if you're going to be that I, like, that's not my work style. So yeah. That's a great story. It makes me think about times I've had in my career where it, for me, it has felt a little bit gender different you know, just in the way that we dance together in our workplace. Um, and as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking of many different times along the way, whether it was um, I had a vision for a program we needed to have here on campus because there were three in the country and none on the West Coast. And I knew SPU was the perfect place for this particular program to be. And given that we have um, the freedom to explore spirituality here on our campus, um, I wanted us to have a medical family therapy program here. And um, it was a cutting edge um, field that was just emerging. And nobody was looking at the integration of spirituality and health in medical family therapy. And I knew we could do that. In fact, now we're 12 years later and you won't pick up a text on medical family therapy and um, not find it um, addressing biopsychosocial spiritual and that is entirely because of the influence we've had on the field but when I brought that forward it was very hard to have my voice heard in part because I didn't have my PhD yet and so I wasn't really thought of as as valuable to the team because in an academic environment the degree you have is more important than the work that you're doing every year. So you can be out producing and writing as much and speaking as much, but when it comes right down to it, it really kind of has to do with the degree and whether you're the chair of the department or the dean or whatever. And I had to really kind of be out there and say, okay, who else can I bring on to my team who can go and push this forward? Because this needs to happen for SPU, this needs to happen. And I think it's, being willing to be invested in your vision and to believe it and then to say who else can I partner with who can help make this happen um, and being willing to have those conversations with those people even though they're hard. I'm thinking of um, recently I, I um, went into my dean because I needed to renegotiate my, um, my entire salary and my um, my um, whatever you call it, my rank. And it was probably the first time I had to have one of those really doggy dog kind of conversations. And I was at home looking on YouTubes on how you negotiate. Like I was just watching them over and over and over again. 
And my, um, I lost my dad about four years ago, and I was missing him so much because I so wanted to like talk to him about how do you really do this? Because it felt so hard, really, as a woman to say, look at dude, <laughs> either we do this or I'm walking because I can get this salary out there now that I have all these you know, other things I've done in my career. So it, sometimes it's just hard to step into a world and have a different kind of voice because in lo- the vast majority of my career, I've been able to be very collaborative and um, with my colleagues and in the work that I do. So I haven't had to develop a really super strong voice, but then there's sometimes that I've really needed it. And so I've had to ask for lots of help to have it. So. I feel like um, a lot, like I said, I'm fairly new in the career and I do work in Boeing and yeah, um, in IT in general, there's a lot fewer women, but I feel like most of my challenges right now, at least in my career, are related to my age rather than my gender. Um, and I don't know why that is, but I have I work with a lot of folks who have children my age, and um, trying to have people um, like if I'm trying to champion something, having them trust and respect an opinion or something that I'm going after is a bit, I I don't know, maybe I'm just perceiving something wrong, but I always feel like it's less related to my gender than my age, but so it's not always a a woman thing. Um, But I have noticed major differences in how women team, teams that are primarily women work versus teams that are primarily men. I was in one particular job where um, it was totally had bucked the trend where the majority of the developers and um, business analysts on a team were women and there was one guy and he was losing it. He goes, why do we have to talk about how our personal lives are every morning? I can't take this. Um, I, if I have to hear about somebody else's kid one more time, I might go crazy. And, um, you know, it, <laughs> and also it was uh, a lot of, there were some older women in there. So it, it was uh, more of me able to kind of, okay, well, calm down. I don't have kids. We don't have to talk about my kids uh, at the time. So um, <laughs> I don't know. It's some funny stories, just the way that people relate to each other um, and communicate styles and communication is totally different. And that's something I've had to um, deal with. Also, a funny story, Uh, when I was pregnant, I was so convinced, I just found out I was pregnant, I was so convinced of a particular product that we needed to buy in order to do something that was immediate and we needed to do it right now and we couldn't wait. And somebody said, good luck on getting so-and-so to do that. And I just lost it. I went into the bathroom and I bawled (laughs) and bawled and bawled. And I came back and I had like makeup everywhere. And... And um, my coworkers were like, oh, you know, there was a um, conference call running right there. So everybody heard you just start bawling. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, that was the most embarrassing thing. Now I can laugh about it, um, but that was the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to me. And I don't think uh, any of my male coworkers in the room were really prepared for that either. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Did you tell me you were just <laughs> laughing really hard? No, I mean, but it was obvious. Yeah. <laughs> and then I was mad because people would be like, what's wrong? And I'd be like, leave me alone. <laughs> I was just all over the place with my emotions. And um, yeah, if I, <laughs> I was so convinced and nobody was going to stop me. And then my boss, I gave this really impassioned, after I was calmed down, I gave this impassioned reason why we had to do this. And he goes, okay. Sounds great. <laughs> and I go, it was, and then I lost it again because I was like, that was so much easier than I had expected it to be. And I had made something up in my mind about, um, you know, how I had expected things to go. And it, <laughs> yeah, anyway, lighten that story up a bit. But <laughs> um, yeah, but mostly I think just learning the differences between how men and women work has just been huge for me and a challenge. Tara, have you ever been on a team that was mostly men? All, all the time, yeah. I, right now I'm on a team of 18, and there are two women. And are you, do you have to adjust your work style? Or 
for you or how does that work for you? I, you know, I kind of like it because the teams where have been mostly women, um, I don't know why this is, but there's this ten tendency towards passive aggressive, passive aggressiveness. And I like how um, I can be straight with most people on my team, which is really nice. Um, and up front and there's um, oh yeah I that's nice uh, let's see changing my work style I, I mean everyone's gonna have different personalities for communication right you know kind of understand that um, person a wants short and sweet emails person B wants really detailed stuff um, but for the most part um, I haven't yeah, I haven't really had any issues with I do have random times where I would talk to, um, like a vendor would come in and I would be sitting with my male coworkers and I'd ask the vendor a question and then they'd answer it to my male coworkers who are sitting right next to me, which always ticks me off, but you know, you let it go. Roll off your back. <laughs> Interesting. Have you, um, I know we talk about male-female, but I like what you said here about female-female relationships in the workplace. Any other thoughts on that from either Tina or Shauna? How have you worked in that arena? Well, I, 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 re I really feel like I've been exceptionally fortunate. Um, those of you that have taken classes in the psych department, you know, those are my peeps and they are good peeps. So, um, and if you've, if you've, if you've been fortunate to get to know anybody in the who teach in the graduate clinical psych or MFT departments, marriage and family therapy department, they're really good people too. So I've been here 23 years, and I wouldn't have stayed here 23 years if they weren't such lovely people or some of my dearest friends. So um, I've I've had a good fortune of working with some really great people. So. Um, there hasn't been a lot of that. There certainly is out there, but these are really lovely people, so I felt really fortunate. When I go traveling, and we, I have friends from all over the United States who teach in similar programs, and um, often um, Claudia Groff Browns, who I teach with, we will talk about how unusual our department is in how we get along compared to our colleagues in other places, and they deal with much more political issues inside their department and inside their schools than we do, and we know how very fortunate we are. So, yeah. Anything that you would add, Sean? Or yeah, um, I mean, I think the only thing that I'd maybe add is one thing I've seen in helping some women is, and I, hard to say this, but for some reason, um, women aren't as confident in starting a business as guys are, and um, so one, one of my goals when is, is to set aside some of the time where I uh, mentor um, folks and then help folks starting a company, set aside some of that time for women, and I only will mentor women. Um, and that's one of the things I really work with them on is like, why wouldn't you do this? What is holding, you know, why would you think you can't, who, why would you ever think you can't? And that's the best advice that I actually heard when I was um, even thinking about this. I had just a fantastic mentor who was like, you should really think about starting your own business. Like, why would you ever not think about that? Um, or how could you even, you know, you're, that's what you should be doing. Why aren't you thinking about that right now? And to have somebody asking you the questions and believing in you, um, I think is really important. It seems to be, and I don't understand if, if, if maybe, I mean, since I'm not a guy, if they're just a little acting a little more confident, but maybe they aren't, aren't actually that confident, but they will get out there and pitch anyone. And, and I've seen fewer women do that, and so I really wanna, I really wanna change that because I don't think that should be the case. Um, I wanna add one note about age, too. I mean, do you guys, I'm probably in this room, you all feel like you're pretty young and it might be hard to go into a company and, what do you know? A lot of people know a lot more than you. I will say one thing is um, you're never going to be the right age, by the way. You're either too young or you're too old. There is never like a right age. And I, I really do feel like that. So um, just know that that's, that you're going to hit this point where all of a sudden you're like, wow, I'm 10 years older than somebody else now. And um, I'm not the youngest person in the room anymore. And um, and so I think that that's um, also a struggle with, with 
you know, women, I think, um, and, and probably men too, but for sure for women. Okay, so let's see. We'll have our third question here. Can you talk a little bit about how you've managed career and family needs while growing your career? And for some of us in the room, that will mean we'll, we will get married and we'll have a family. For some of us, that means we have, um, we have family expectations on us. Maybe there's a family business that we have to be a part of. Um, maybe we'll have aging grandparents that have cared for us or um, aging parents as we go through the, through the world. But how have you been able to manage just balancing the needs and demands of family and your, your passion and your desire for your work and growing your career? Yeah, that's been a challenge. <laughs> yeah, that's been a challenge. I mean, I've only been, uh, I mean, getting married wasn't a big deal. I was still 100% career focused. So um, I've been back to work since January of last year and had, um, that's been a bit, bit of an adjustment because it's suck on my time <laughs> I mean, whereas before I didn't have any problem like oh yeah I'll get back online from 9 to 11 p.m. every night <laughs> for while I'm working on this project um, now I have to you know get the baby to bed and then you know make sure everything's ready for the next day learning a routine has been um, something you know I th they always say go to college and you'll learn time management skills I didn't know anything about time management until I <laughs> had a baby so um, I have um, had to get real intentional about planning my time and planning my relationships and um, time that I, you know I spend with other people um, cut out unnecessary things wherever possible and um, you know make adjustments for where is daycare? We just recently moved our son over to the daycare that's right next to my building, and I'm paying extraordinary amount of money for that daycare. But um, it's getting me home sooner, which is important, and uh, generally making us happier. So um, balancing that. At first, I was really afraid of putting like pictures of my son up on my computer because I didn't want people to think, oh, well, she's a mom now. She's going to check out. Um, I'm slowly like adding pictures and everything. And now I'll talk, show people pictures on my cell phone and be like, oh, isn't he so cute? <laughs> um, but um, yeah, that was one of my big worries at first was like, I don't want people to think less of me because I um, have a baby now and think that I'm gonna be, um, you know, not fully committed to what I'm working on right now at work. And um, let's see. Um, had to cut out a lot of TV. <laughs> don't watch TV anymore, but um, yeah, it's been good and challenging all at the same time because I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm trying not to get prideful, but it feels good when I'm able to be like, I finished this, and we got dinner done tonight, <laughs> and um, that's that's a big deal for me. Just getting dinner on the table, it's been a big deal. So. Have people been supportive of you in the workplace as a mom or? Yeah, yeah, for the most part. And like I said, I was really concerned about how people would perceive me afterwards. So I like tried not to take any sick days whatsoever. Um, yeah, and I hardly took any vacation last year, which was kind of a bad thing. It's my new year resolution to take all my vacation. Um, but they've been, um, my coworkers have generally been pretty supportive of everything um, most times so. and that's I know I'm fortunate it's really one of the reasons why I'm staying where I am I mean I enjoy my job I love it um, and every time I think well I could do I could go to Google because they move faster they could you know I could go to a startup because oh my gosh this project is taking forever I totally understand how you feel <laughs> um, <laughs> But then at the same time, I'm like, would I lose out on some of the benefits that I've got right now? And I'm paid yeah. pretty darn well, so I don't have much to complain about um, at all. Yeah. <laughs> Next, anybody? <laughs> 
<laughs> Tara, when you use the word intentional, that was the word that I think comes to mind first. Um, as life becomes more and more complicated, I think for me, my level of intentionality just went up. And <clears throat> I think if I if I could, ha I don't. I don't know that I would have done anything any differently, but I, I think when I look back, um, if I could have looked into the complexity of how life would have gotten, um, there's, there's some wisdom that I would have liked to have had. So things like, it's Im obviously important to love what you do, um, but to look at the environment with which you're going to do it into and make sure that that environment is going to work for your life too. So like when I learned I didn't want to go back to working in a situation where I was going to have to be there all day, every day, all the time, and I had an opportunity to be in a job that was going to allow a little bit more flexibility where some days I was at school, you know, all day, but then there were a couple days a week I could work for home, from home. That actually worked better for me with having kids. I always knew every quarter what my schedule was going to be. So I made most games and most um, teacher conferences because I knew what my schedule was. It was pretty easy to work around. And so my work environment, actually my schedule and the, my passion that I had worked for the rest of my life. So that kind of intentionality was actually really helpful. Um, when I did the study on women duly called to motherhood and career, it was interesting. I, I interviewed 11 women who described themselves as feeling very passionate about both their career and being moms. And I never asked a question about their partners, but every single one of the women talked about their partners. and. They said, the vast majority of them were very, very happy in their partnerships, and they said, I'm married to somebody who is very supportive of who I am as a person and the passion that I have in my career, and they want me to be happy and successful at what I do, so they work right alongside me in everything we do at home. And they told stories of, for a while, he was changing his career, so he stayed home, and da -da 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 -da. they told all these stories of collaboration in their relationship. And um, so having a partner and not a project is a really important thing that you choose. If you're going to partner, if that's a lifestyle you want, you want to choose your partner well. And you want somebody who wants a dynamic partner. Be and that that's more important to them um, than somebody who's just going to take care of things. because. If they want a dynamic partner, it means they're going to be doing more to keep the household running too with you because you're both going to be doing stuff outside the home as well as inside the home. So they're going to want to, you know, they're going to have to want to also run things with you. Um, and I think the other thing is just the intentionality that you have to have to take care of yourself. I think women are notoriously bad at taking care of themselves, men are often better at that. They listen to their bodies more, I think, often than women do. They put themselves last. That came out of my study, too, that women were like, well, we took care of my kids, and I take care of my job, and then I just, I really don't take care of myself. And when women run empty, it's just not good anywhere. And I think it took me a really long time to learn to listen to myself. And everything runs better when you listen to yourself. So being intentional to really learn to figure out how full is your tank or how empty is it and what restores you and what can restore you in five minutes and what takes an hour and what takes two days and how do you do that. So letting pleasure be an okay part of your life I think is an important thing. So those things took me a long time to learn but I kind of wish I got them a little bit sooner. So Yeah, I echo that one because about two months after I got back to work I was um, harried all over the place and um, my husband stopped me and he goes Tara I'm on your side um, you don't seem to realize that that um, you know I'm here to help you and um, you know he had been doing like the bottles for me every night because um, I breastfeeding was important to me so I had to pump at work and everything and I was just by the time I got home I was 
stressed out because I had to spend longer at work because I was pumping and all of this stuff. And um, he goes, how can I help you? You're not asking me for help. I'm here to help you. We're a team. And that was kind of like a slap in the face for me because I had been ignoring him. And um, there's, yeah, he's a great guy and I'm very lucky. And I echo everything she said. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think I have a totally different story. I loved what you just had to say. That was so great. Um, you know, I just focus, I, you know, I think maybe admittedly, you know, too much on my career. And I really saw that as my major focus. And um, it was like if something came along great, but I wasn't really, I like wasn't making, you know, a lot of the, the time for it that I should have. And I think, you know, I don't have any regrets and I wouldn't have done anything differently, but like, I definitely could have, you know, spent a little bit more time having balance. Um, but just recently, you know, after after we sold Decide, um, which has been about a year and a half now, um, I did make a bunch of changes and reevaluated what's important and just had the space and time to do that, which I felt so lucky that I had that. And I mean, a few of the things that I've done, which actually have made me feel so free, um, just to free up my time, but I've been thinking about all the ways I can free up my time and really have even a better level of balance right now. So I really went through, I mean, I didn't have a lot of stuff in my house, but I went through and I cleaned everything out that I haven't been using, like every single thing. And I thought, what if I could only have a few things in the house, like the furniture plus just a few things, like everything, there's just, it's easy to like keep you know, all the badges from conferences and just different fun things and all, like my all my t-shirts from SPU that I, you know, played volleyball with that I was always going to make a quilt with, you know, just all these <laughs> things that I was going to do and it just, it's like, but then you have a hundred of those different things and um, I just realized like I could feel so free if I could not have all this stuff and so I did that. Another thing that I did, and this might sound a little crazy, but I was pretty proud of this. I went through and automated all of the decisions in my life that I don't really want to spend time on. So for instance, like, buying I don't, I don't even go to the grocery store and buy like cleaning supplies and stuff anymore I just have them automatically delivered every two or three months depending on how often I need them like anything that I could automate any decision I've done so I could not even think about it and just have it delivered and I mean I spend a lot of time going to the store every week and I was like how can I cut that out and that actually is saving me like dozens of hours a year. I mean, I'm sort of analytical about this. Like, how can I save a lot of time? Um, but it, ma it made me so happy to think like, I just saved 20 hours a year. <laughs> I don't have to go through four aisles of the grocery store anymore. So, um, so it's been fun to think about creative ways I can make space and, and time for um, you know other things in life. So it's been it's been good. Well, I think about Shauna and. Um, 20 hours a year is 20 hours a year to, you're giving away, right? Because you're doing a lot of volunteer work. Yeah. And, and so um, I love that idea of automating everything that, that you can. Things that, some people love to go to the grocery store. I'm like, my husband, he loves to go to the grocery store. I'm like, I couldn't, if I never went to another grocery store for the rest of my life, I'd be totally happy. <laughs> and so you have to kind of figure out, you have to intentionally choose those things. Like Tina was saying, intentionally choose things. Yeah. Tara, what did you cook recently? Oh yeah, I did. I posted on my Facebook page. I did a month's worth of or three weeks oh. worth of uh, freezer meals. I spent idea. all day, and Sean helped me. I, he he freezer bagged all of my meals that I made. Um, so now we have months worth of meals that I don't actually have to like cook. I can just pull them out, thaw them, put them in the crock pot, and then I have food when I get home. It's magic. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's so intentional. Then that frees up a whole bunch oh, more yeah. time, right? And, it, and gets rid of your stress level. Yeah, you should have seen cook yeah. every night. Yeah. You should have seen him space when I brought home all the Costco stuff. He's like, oh my goodness, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, and then we got home from and had dinner last night. He's like, this is a great idea. Yeah, we should do this all the time. <laughs> now, hopefully they all turn out that good. But yeah, the first one was edible, so it was happy. Oh, that's great. I love the idea, too, about decluttering your house, mm -hmm. because I just read an article about so how to get rid of 2015 things in 2015. Oh, wow. It's a real challenge. I thought, I wonder if I can get rid of 2015 things this year. Yeah. Well, um, that is the end of our questions. I wanted to open it up for uh, questions from you. We have um, the session that goes until 5.30, but we actually have extra time beyond this. So if you'd like to stay and ask, continue to ask questions, you're welcome to. But it, if you have a question for one of the panelists, please go ahead and share. Yeah. Um, 
you touched on this a little bit about um, your husbands or partners in a relationship helping um, helping you out with either household tasks or other things in life. Um, and like I read, I recently read a statistic that um, it was from a book on the work situation for the women in Japan mm-hmm. and how um, they, their husbands usually only help about seven minutes in a day with household tasks, whereas the average in America, um, and this was a little bit old, was about 30 minutes a day. And I was wondering, and maybe this is a question for Dr. Sellers, but um, do you think that's because, as you touched on, like maybe the women aren't asking for help, or just because of the way that it's just, I don't know. Do you, do you, did you find anything in research or is that? Well, I, I do think that, you know, statistics kind of water things down. So you're going to have some places where maybe men aren't involved at all or very little and some where they're involved a whole lot. We have lots of stay-at-home dads now where we didn't have any a generation ago. We certainly have men that are much more involved now than there was even a generation ago. Um, I, I, I don't know any research, but if I was going to make a guess, I would say that as you move up the education ladder with women, you're going to see corresponding men more involved at home. Uh, my guess is, and because I've just sort of noticed that women ask more, they, I think they have, feel stronger in asking, and there's more egalitarian relationships as you move, have more education. Um, and I think there are more men who've actually been raised in homes where they saw dads being involved in stuff so um, I and with that all said um, there's still a lot of women that that have a hard time asking and still feel like they should be doing it all Um, and I I think that it's an important to ask ourselves the question to um, what role has the church played in this Many people have grown up in very traditional ideas around, um, like one of the reasons I even did that study to begin with is because we had a grant that looked at vocation. And I wanted to study women, Christian women, who felt duly called to motherhood and career primarily because we didn't have any way to look into that. And so many Christian women described themselves as feeling like, once I had a child, I'm not allowed to love my career. And I wanted to look at that. We needed to hear their voice. Um, so I think that there's a way in which, too, that the, the church can sometimes not be as helpful in that. So um, I don't know. I think it's, I don't know that I'm answering your question, but I, I do think we have to encourage people to live into all of their gifts and caring for their family is part of that. And caring for their home is part of that. Yeah, I love this question, by the way. I think earlier in my career, I would have felt like this is all my fault that I can't deal with this situation. Why can't I adapt to to work in this situation? Why can't I be throwing the football around right now and right up in their face? Like, here's exactly what we're going to do, you know, pointing in their face or whatever I needed to do. Um, but I think I, I absolutely love being this age, by the way. I... I was so awkward when I was in college. I didn't realize it then, but like looking back, I was like, oh my God, like life just got better and better and better for me as I got older. (laughs) And right now I'm like, I think I'm like, you know, hopefully I'll just keep going up into the right. But I also, at this point in my career, like I 
feel like I have a voice and nobody is going to tell me how to feel at this point or what's right for me. I'm going to tell them. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Um, and you know, but it take, you have to be thoughtful about when you get to that point. And I was at that point in that position where I felt like it's just, if it's all guys in a room, I could see how they would do that. It's like a locker room sort of feel like it was almost as if we were going out on battle right after that meeting and going to, you know, we were the Seahawks and we're going to go play, you know, like that's, that's how it operated just because of the dynamic. And it, it's not all about gender, but it was just the dynamic of the team too. And so earlier in my career, I would have probably like, I would have waited a lot longer before I said anything. And if I ever said anything, I might have just like sort of suffered a little bit and then not had a voice in that meeting. If I even stayed there, I might have just left. I w probably wouldn't have brought it up. But now I'm at the point where I'm like, I know who I am and I'm, I really love who I am right now. And I know it works for me and doesn't. And I have, I have other, I mean, there's always other options. There's so many different places to go and so many different things to explore. And if this isn't the right place for me, I know there's, there's another place I could be. So, um, but I would say that it's not always the case, right? Like, I, I don't think everybody needs to alter to me. It's it, that situation was enough where I like knew that's what I had to do. But most of the time I still do kind of try to figure out what works and slate myself into a situation that works and how I can support best. But I would say if I could have learned that earlier in my career, I really wish I could have because it took me until I'm now, until like two years ago before I was like starting to stand up for myself. And by the way, asking for raises too. I didn't do that earlier in my career. It was just hard to do. Nobody, nobody taught me how to do that and nobody prepared me. And I, and I should have looked at YouTube videos. I didn't even do that. <laughs> but, um, but wow, I wish I would have learned that earlier in my career because I, now I tell people on my team that they should ask for a raise. I actually tell them that. I'm like, you might want to you know, bring this up at some point because you're rocking it and you're doing a great job. And, you know, but I'm not going to do it for them. So they have to do the work on why, you know, and, and um, I don't always do that, but I've done it to two people, um, two people that I've managed before who just, like, I think they would never have asked for a raise. So those are some of the things I wish I had been more bold about, because if you don't ask, you don't, you don't get the help you need. Yeah, I think it ever, if it ever comes to a point where, you know, like she said, she's cons maybe I, you know, second guessing whether or not you should actually stay there. I think you have a responsibility to talk to those people and bring it up. I mean, you're not going to, you're just going to make yourself miserable. You have, yeah, anyway, it is, you have to do it. <laughs> it's not a question, I don't think. But I would say too, the response was so great that I got that I will, that it like encourages me to do more of it. Like, oh, they didn't even know that they, that was hard for me. <laughs> I thought they knew, like, yeah. So. It's 5.30, so we're going to officially um, end the session, but you're welcome to stay and ask any questions of our panelists if you'd like to. And I'd just like to say thank you to each one of you. It was a great